it's hard, as academics, you, you can't be making decisions about one technology in a positive light and other technologies in a negative light just because that's how you feel. Choices that you're constantly making when you're having conversations about whether you're making things more or less depressing. <laughs> and it's actively trying to keep the positive, positive parts of your brain engaged. Basically I'm saying, go and talk to some comedians. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to season two of Conversations on Climate, the podcast series which has been developed in partnership with the London Business School's Alumni Energy Club, which have been leading a series of conversations with experts from around the world, exploring the biggest challenge of our time, climate change. Coming to today from the 13th Annual Festival of Education, held at the beautiful Wellington College. I can confidently say that today's guest is unique. Dr. Matthew Winning leads a double life, a successful academic and a successful comedian. That fact alone is unusual, but the fact that he does exclusively climate change comedy is exceedingly rare. Climate change has long been neglected as a topic for comedians, and although it's getting more mentions in mainstream, what makes Matt unique is his credentials and depth of understanding on the subject from an academic perspective. A holder of a PhD in environmental economics in Strathclyde University, Matt has performed sold-out, full-length solo shows at the world-famous Edinburgh Festival. Is the author of Hot Mess, What on Earth Can We Do About Climate Change, and is host of the BBC radio programme Net Zero, A Very British Problem, and of the Operation Earth podcast. His burning passion to help solve climate change in both aspects of his work is abundantly clear and provides insights that you just won't want to miss. Around 80% of people who listen to this podcast haven't hit the follow button. If we could ask you for a small favor, if you do enjoy our conversations, please do hit that follow button on your app. It would help us in the show more than I could possibly say. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to speak to us today and uh, thanks very much for arranging for us to come to this wonderful venue. <laughs> I did very little, <laughs> uh, but thanks for having me. Okay, perfect. You are, if I may dare say, unique. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Everybody's unique, but... Uh... Yeah. In, your, in your backgrounds, uh, you come from um, you know, hardcore, like you know, Dr. Matt. Uh, hardcore uh, climate academics, uh, cl climate economist, and um, you also have a very successful career as a stand-up comedian, focusing on climate, <laughs> yep. which is a very, very unusual set of set, set of set of structures. Um, now, there must be like I'm, I'm implying here, but there must be kind of two sides to you, like the the the, the scholar and the clown. <laughs> and like, how do they fit together? And how do they, how do they, they, they seem kind of polar opposites, but they're embodied in the one human being. How does, how does that work? They're all complex, yeah. is the, is the uh, short answer to that. It, you're right. I mean, the scholar and the clown, I've never quite put it that way before, but I like it, firstly. Um, certainly when I do the clown part, the comedy part, I often play up to the stereotypes of the scholar or whatever, you know, the academic stereotypes that we have. I didn't think I would necessarily become an academic when I was younger. It wasn't something that I intended to do. I was very much came at it from answering, the, being interested in the problem of climate change and trying to solve that. And it just so happened that the route I ended up taking, I guess a lot of people do, it felt like a very academic subject and often that was the way in. And it feels like only recently have other industries and sectors been like, we really should have someone that's looking at this. I feel like when I started 15 years ago or whatever, it was a lot more like, this is an academic issue and you kind of have to go through academia to solve it. I think thankfully now it's less of that. Um, but yeah, I think everybody's, everybody's a bit more complicated than, than stereotypes would let on. So. Both of them are very much parts of my personality. Um, and they were very separate parts of my personality for about eight or nine years, where I was doing comedy as a way to not talk about climate change. And eventually, I ran out of material and decided to talk about climate change. And, the, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad that I did, because I was quite lucky in the fact that I went, sort of came to this uh, epiphany of like, oh, this is actually quite a useful way to 
to talk about it. Um, so it made my life a lot easier when I combined those two things. It, it was a lot more of a sort of uh, Jekyll and Hyde beforehand, but doing the comedy about climate change gave me some sort of inner peace. They're not natural bedfellows. <laughs> no, no, no. I didn't think it was necessarily possible or a good idea, and I was somebody that had done comedy for, not as I say, almost a decade at that time. And, and when you do speak to members of the public or people, you tell people that that's what you do, uh, it is a bit of a surprise. It's a bit kind of, I mean, I use a joke. When, I mean, my opening joke is literally that, where I say, you know, I, I'm a, a climate researcher and a stand-up comedian, which is a bit like finding out someone is a, an estate agent and also a really nice person. <laughs> um, it, you know, it, it's just that sort of like, how do you, you know, how do you take this? And, and I, yeah, I was surprised that it, it worked that it worked or that it was a good idea. Um, but slowly when you do it and you perform to people, people, I think, quickly come around to like, oh, this is, I see why this is effective and I see why this is a good thing to, to do. Okay. And that kind of leads us nicely into, uh, you, so you've been, you've, you've got some really kind of notable success in your, your stand-up uh, career. You've had, uh, what's like, four sellout shows in the, the Edinburgh yeah. Fringe, you know, that's fa fantastic. So that, that'll give you some kind of unique insights into, you know, how c comedy and cli climate fit. Yeah. What do you think the appetite for and reception to climate change, change comedy is, and how has it evolved over the last few years? Ah, that's a very good question. So the first year that I tried it, um, and, and, and when I say tried it, I dabbled in it a little bit for, you know, a few minutes, a routine or five minutes or something like that. And I thought, well, nobody really wants to listen to this. And we're talking over the last, te you know, that was sort of the, the early half of 2010 to say 2015, something like that. And then when it came to sort of 2016, 2017, I decided that I wanted to talk about it at length. And so committed to, well, I'm gonna talk about this for an hour. And people will be in room a room, <laughs> unless they leave, listening to this for an hour. You know, it's much more of a, a commitment then where it wasn't part of lots of other bits of comedy. It was, this is a one hour show about, about climate change. No one else was doing it and it still wasn't particularly in the zeitgeist, shall we say, I don't think, at that point in time. We had things like, in the UK, Brexit and other, these were the big issues. Um, and the impacts of climate change were perhaps not quite as apparent to the public in general. So that first year, it was a bit different. Nobody had really done it. I had been aware of one or two other comedians that had touched on it a little bit. So it was quite a unique thing to do that year. And every year since then, it's pretty much become more and more of the zeitgeist, certainly in 2019, with, you know, Extinction Rebellion and Greta and all these things. Every comedian at the Edinburgh Fringe had a joke about climate change that year. That was not the case a year or two previously. And now it seems like it is, there are more people talking about it. It's, it's sort of becoming part of the conversation and part of what feels like audiences would want to hear about. I don't know if that's better or worse for me because, because more people are interested in doing it. Yeah. But uh, it's a good thing for climate change. One thing that we've, uh, a topic we kind of keep on coming back to in the podcast is kind of related to that. It's um, what is the, the role of the expert in these conversations? Like, can, is there a value to the non-experts talking about things that are pretty nuanced? No, actually, they're very nuanced, they're very complicated. Um, should we be trying to defer to expertise or is there a role to be played for the non-experts also also going out and talking to a mass audience about things? I think it's really important to have non-experts. And ideally, if they can work with experts, that's probably the, the best combination. But the reason that we need non-experts is we need everybody to be talking about climate change. And we need people 
audiences of different types to see people that are like them talking and caring about climate change because that's how people become invested in it and, and understand it. So it's so important that non-experts talk about it because if you've just got experts then it comes back to that way that it's seen as only experts can talk about this because they're the only people we see talking about this. I say there's a small role for experts in talking about climate change, but actually what we need 90% of is sports stars or, you know, the person at your bingo hall, whoever it is. Yeah, I think you, I mean, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head with that question, but yeah, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to have non-experts talking about climate change. Great. I'm going to drill down and look more specifically into, um, into comedy. Yep. Now, um, there is, again, there's another debate that goes around is, is climate this uh, like existential threat that's, that's, that's just coming to eat us all? Yeah. Is it a laughing matter? Should we, be, should we be laughing about it? It's not a funny, inherently funny subject, but neither is, you know, war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, MASH, for instance, was the biggest, most popular sitcom of all time in the United States, it's how it's done and how you talk about it. it. Things need to be talked about through different mediums. It could be really dark. I've seen lots of heavy plays about climate change. It doesn't actually help that much because it's already a really heavy subject. And so to balance things, to make it more relevant to people's lives and to their spectrum of emotions, I think comedy is one thing that can do that. Ideally, you would have the light and the dark in there because again, we're complicated. I'm a comedian and a researcher and climate change is really heavy and serious and funny at times. You know, everything's far more nuanced than we sort of give it credit for. But the reason that comedy is so good at talking about climate change is first and foremost... Which actually was the next question. Was it? <laughs> I'll let you ask it and then I'll just answer it. It is right. Um, the reason that it's good for talking about it is Firstly, it doesn't feel as heavy. So a lot of people don't want to listen and talk about it because it is so heavy. So then to say, well, it's not something we should laugh about means that you're entirely negating a way of talking about something and getting people engaged. If anything, you're, it's self-defeating that notion. It is actually really important to use comedy because it's a, a way of as I say, getting people to put their foot in the door to listen to someone talking about it for the first time and maybe understanding a bit more about it and then feeling like, okay, maybe I'm actually able now to read a more heavy book about it or, you know, spend a bit of time listening to this. So it's a really good first step for people. It keeps them entertained engaged you know there's a way of you know even as a teaching tool people use and we're at the festival of education today uh maybe i'll mention it later on during my talk but you know using comedy is a really good way of just stimulating positive parts of people's brains so when they're learning they've got much more positive associated thoughts with something because they're enjoying themselves and they're much more likely to retain information and have a positive learning experience that they wouldn't have if you're just given a really heavy lecture where the brain shuts down because it's like well i'm i'm not enjoying this so i'm gonna shut off so it, it has an educational benefit um and i think it's an important way for society to talk about it and it's probably as a, as a sort of third benefit of using comedy it's a way of coping that we use comedy to cope with grief and other things and and, a, and that's very much climate there's a lot of grief about it well you know loss and so I think as long as it's done well and you're punching up and not down you know um, then it's a, a good way of talking about it but that's you know I, I, there are things I shy away from because you know you never want to talk about the you know people's you, you're not making light of people's lives at all and there are co really complicated parts that are really difficult to talk about as well. Um, so it's hard to, yeah, it can be hard to get into it with some stuff, but, but yeah, I think 
I think it's a, a really important way of talking about it. Mm. Okay, and are there particular kind of genres of comedy that are better suited? No. The answer to that is no. Okay. I think you need, like, very much like with all climate action, you need a, a palette. You need to just try everything again to reach different people. Because if certain people like one type of comedy, then if you say, well, we shouldn't use this, we should use something else, mm. well, maybe those people aren't being catered for. So it is, it's about trying to reach different audiences. Well, I'm just going to go back to a theme that we kind of touched on a little earlier. Um, comedy has had, in a lot of parts, very positive impacts on changing yeah. social norms. But it's also been used as a way of, of, of minimising, of, of, of laughing down yeah. at, uh, as, as, as you said, at, uh, of um, important issues. Um, now, there, I know there's also a, a question of whether you'd want to be trying to put kind of normative, normative limits around, around comedy. Yeah, yeah. But is there a way of kind of protecting against comedy being used as another form of greenwashing? Yeah, it's, a good, it's a really good question, actually. Um, I think the answer is unfortunately not. I think, um, I think you kind of have to accept that it's an approach that can be used without getting too, uh, you know, for good or evil. Yeah, without getting too Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's not. It's um, yeah. The, the, the light and the dark side of the force have equal, uh, you know, ability to become comedians and use those tools to do what, you know, what. so you can't really stop people doing stuff. You hope it has less impact. As people understand climate change more, you hope that people become a bit more aware of what's being used against them or, or aware of the types of kind of messaging and stuff like that. But it's a, it's a really tricky area where the messaging and, and communication what you're doing here talking about climate change is an area that can have massive impacts on large groups of people and given where we are today with youtube and whatever it's a bit of a wild west at times mm -hmm. in terms of the types of comedy that's out there or whatever and how it's used um, and as you say large advertising budgets for companies can be used to try to well, it's undermine or sort of take people's attention away from t in different directions as well. Yeah, and speaking of, nice segue there, um, your book? <laughs> <laughs> Hot Mess. Uh, yes. Brilliant title. Thank you. Really, 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 really enjoyed it. Um, now, it's, of course, it takes a, a light-hearted view on, on, on climate. But one thing that's really striking in it is you do not shy away in any way, shape or form from the, from the emotional side. Could you kind of give us a little bit of, of background insight into your own emo emotional journey with climate? You know, I started working on this 2007, 8, and had been aware of it sort of since the mid 2000s. The way that I kind of got into it was at university, finishing up doing a, my undergraduate degree, doing my master's degree. I kept taking environmental courses, and then for the first time in my life, noticing that I enjoyed learning <laughs> and what, what was even it's just like I was really invested it felt like a sensible thing to do to be like well this is something that clearly I don't know if I at that time I would even say I care about but that that I am clearly enthused by so why don't I try and kind of take this and you learn at the time more about climate change and stuff and you know sort of the injustices of it all and then you know forward you know starting a PhD and you forward how long 12 years later I'm then starting writing a book and a comedy book covering the entire spectrum of climate change and and how I personally feel about it and I had a a, a, a child at the time you know a baby at the time that year and how does that make you feel and you can't um, separate climate change from where you are in your life as well. Um, and in your book, you frame the chapters in part around um, the stages of pregnancy of your yeah. wife. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
has having a child um, changed your, your your relationship with climate at all? Or? I don't know. Is the is the real answer to that? I think. Yeah, I think it has. In the. You know, I, I think I already. I think my defence mechanisms to climate change are already. The the wall the the walls the turrets or whatever are being built higher and higher because when I do open myself up to it emotionally, it can become even harder than it has to be able to deal with those things. And I do find myself getting angrier quicker about stuff. That could be the lack of sleep. Um, <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to know. Um, yeah, it, it's it, it does make it feel a bit more visceral. Is that the right word? Mm. You know, it feels. But but not in a way that you know makes it even more important than anyone how anyone else feels about it. It just it gives you this view of life and where you are at your the different stages in your life and how you realise that you've been the, the sort of that first generation and now you've moved into this middle part of your life. You know, I, I, and so it may be restricted, that responsibility perhaps restricts you a bit in terms of, you know, in my 20s, I went out and just did co comedy every night. And it was a lot easier to do that um, uh, and not sort of worry about anyone else. And I think that's a good time in your life to be able to do that, to go out and to do stuff and make noise and explore things and stuff. and. And you don't want to lose that, but then you realise with other responsibilities, time becomes a bit more limited to be able to do things like that. And so you have to be a bit more, you have to pick and choose things a bit more. And and that can be, yeah, not frustrating, but it can be a bit challenging at times to know what's the, what's the right amount of time for me to miss dead times, <laughs> to go and talk to other people about climate change, because before, that wasn't an issue. People asked me to do stuff. As long as it seemed like a good idea, I'd go and do it. Um, so what I'm saying is I should probably be franchising my shows out to people in their mid-20s. Right. <laughs> so if anyone wants to do that, very low pay, um, do get in touch. <laughs> Great. And why do you think it's people in their mid-twenties that are far more invested in climates than generations previous? Um, well, yeah, mid-twenties, teenagers. I think these people understand, you know, they've grown up with this their entire lives. Certainly their entire sort of teenage adult lives. It's, it's a constant injustice. It doesn't feel like, to, you know, to, to older generations it maybe feels like, oh, there's this new thing that's come along or another issue and so yeah i mean i think younger people uh quite rightly are massively engaged in climate change at the moment because it's it's their lives and the rest of their lives that are going to be impacted by this and they feel let down mm. and, I, and they should be and you know a lot of people uh over the last couple of years with the school strikes and stuff would say you know it gives me so much hope seeing these young people in the streets and that's the weirdest thing in the world is to look yeah. to young people to give you hope the most sort of selfish you know internally focused view of the world possible and it's not what should i be doing to help these people to mm. to stop them having to feel like they have to go and do this and i'm sure some people mm. did you know but 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 if your response to seeing that was, oh, that gives me hope, and then, you know, going back to just doing your own daily life. Yeah, there's something fundamentally wrong about taking hope from the despair of children. <laughs> yeah, that's a much more uh, <laughs> succinct way of putting it than I did. There's a tendency amongst the likes of us <laughs> who spent a lot of time looking at this stuff and thinking <laughs> about this stuff uh, to make the assumption that science has won and that everybody knows this is an issue. But then you go out and you start and you talk to people and you realize, no, actually, it's, there's, there's still an awful lot of people who aren't just talking about kind of like, you know, they're not ready for talking about the nuance. They still, they still need to be, to be talking about talking through first principles. Yeah. Um, 
And your book is very much framed for that for for that type of type of market. It's for like what what, what was yeah. what was your decision making process on that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I always want to to have it as that sort of introductory. So anyone that could be coming at this that doesn't have a detailed background about climate change, who sort of just knows the rough idea of it, I, w I wanted to aim it at them because. I think a lot of books out there are aimed at people like, you know, people will write a book that is, if you want to know about climate change, but it's heavy. And not that many people want to just read a heavy book about a subject that they know little about. So the idea was to try to, you know, make it an accessible thing that maybe someone like us would buy for our sister or brother for Christmas. So one of the problems I had with the book when it came out was that it was put by the publishers in the environmental section of bookstores. And the only people that go to the environmental section of bookstores are people that already want to read environmental books. The hardest problem I've had with climate change comedy is how do you market it to, to people that like comedy but that aren't already into climate change? And once I've solved that, I'll come back to you <laughs> and I'll let you know. Um, you know, when people uh, do pick the book up and read it that don't have that background, you know, or interest in climate, they do tend to really enjoy it and be surprised. It's the surprise that's there where they're like, I didn't you know, think I would necessarily enjoy this or, you know, as much as I did or learn as much as I did. And that's where the real, you know, that's where I get the most from this is when someone contacts me who's, you know, a trucker in America who's like, I listened to the audiobook of this and loved it. it was, mm -hmm. You know, and I, I'm a truck, like, yeah. you know, people that are just sort of dipping their toes into that aspect. So, you know, I'm, I'm already sort of pitching ideas for other things, but I'm trying to aim it much more at specific audiences. And you know, so, so the next book, fingers crossed, would be a sport, is gonna be a sports book about climate change that's aimed at people that like sports and it'll be in the sports section. You know who you're talking to mm -hmm. and you can narrow it down and be kind of specific about that. And I think that's kind of what we need to be doing more with climate changes. We need to have specific audiences in mind and we need to be aiming things at those audiences mm -hmm. and what they care about and what sort of things they want to consume because climate change is about everything, literally about everything. And it's, it is, it's a massive kind of systemic problem. Yeah. Like it's the, 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 whole, the whole world we're living in has got, you know, they're, they're like politics, business, like everything needs to get, get in beyond it. But the advice um, in the book is very much about individual actions. And the, diffi the, the reason that a lot of the book and a lot of the stuff that I talk about tends to be about individual actions is that it's trying to personalise it. And a lot of comedy is observational comedy, for instance. So you, you have to have observed something and we have to have something shared that you show from a surprise angle that people go, yeah, I do. It's very hard to do that about carbon trading, because. Right? <laughs> Not everybody's, and so you can write some stuff. You know, it's a bit of a joke in itself at the well, moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. But beyond that, it's it's hard to go into detail and make it relevant to people's lives. Mm -hmm. So I, and it's something that I struggle a bit with, is that I probably put more emphasis on individual parts of stuff because it's easier to talk to people about those, and that media has the same problem. So the media often does the exact same thing because it knows that it's personalising it and making it relevant to people so they'll read about it. Mm. But not everybody wants to read about, you know, really complex, nuanced, dispersed topics. And so trying to get that bit across can be a little bit harder. And I, I did try, you know, the kind of last third of the book is more on that. How do we stop looking inwards as individuals and start looking outwards? to how we can impact the rest of society rather than how can I impact my own life. So, and then that outward looking part hopefully begins to have more of a wider impact on these sorts of topics that are a bit more mm. 
nebulous. Can I take the opportunity kind of to, to bridge between that kind of, um, you know, what we were just talking about, the kind of climate communications and the academic, yeah. and maybe kind of taking the, you work, you work with the, the Lancet uh, countdown, is that yeah. kind of like useful bridge? Uh, yeah, because yeah. it cover, 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 covers both, both sides, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cover, covers both, both sides of, of your, your, your work. Obviously, Lancet, for those who don't know, it's one of the leading medical publications in the world, and they put together this um, you know, publication, which kind of takes all sorts of different parts of, like, it isn't just about medicine, it's also you know, economics and politics, and you know, brings, brings it all together into one publication. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, and also how you managed to get involved in that in the first place? Yeah, well, um, it, it, so, you know, it's an annual publication about climate change and health and trying to track that over time is what we're doing with lots of different indicators and it's sort of it's it's evolved a little bit and they're trying to you know add indicators over time and work it's, you know it's, it's been going from 2015 I think roughly um, and it's it's kind of academics in different parts whether that's looking at the impact side of things things related to heat you know and uh, health impacts I specifically look at one indicator on basically fossil fuel use and how that evolves over time for different countries and different regions. Um, but obviously fossil fuel use, especially in homes for cooking, is yeah. you know, not something we want to use, but it's also from you know coal and other things, so it has health impacts. So it's really wide ranging and it's got a lot of academics from a lot of different areas. Uh, but it's trying to trying to really bring together a coherent narrative about what's happening at any point in time between those links between climate change and health because I think it's and the reason that I got involved was that I think it's a really important way of making it um, accessible and relevant to people's daily lives mm -hmm. people understand health yeah but we still struggle a little bit I think even with our own health you know we can struggle a little to to, rem to remember constantly how important it is and to look after ourselves when there are so many other things happening. And that's kind of the same with climate change, you know. We know that these things are important, but, and that cha you know, changing it will impact our health, but we kind of maybe don't make the connections, obviously, but, um, but I think it's a really good way of, like, if you can have a conversation with someone about it or get some really good statistics in front of them about it, it's a really accessible and obvious way to, to start those conversations. Mm. Yeah. And one thing that's really, um, it's really kind of positive development in that publication and others is um, up until quite recently, we were all kind of working in very much our own little silos. Mm -hmm. Like this, this publication pulls together all sorts of different, different strands and uh, you know, yeah, try, yeah. Try, try, tries to unite them. What do you think are the kind of the strengths and weaknesses of that type of approach? The strengths are that it's much, it's bringing it all together and then it's easy to communicate those things all together and to link them. Um, so the strength is really, instead of talking about each silo individually, you're talking about health, but you're talking about, well, here's the health impacts, here's the solutions, here's the finance related to that, and you can string a narrative together that works for those things. The difficulty is academia, essentially, as a, as a thing. Uh, in that getting people to talk to each other across different disciplines is a, a tricky thing to do. And I think it's really important to do more of that sort of interdisciplinary work. The, the sort of siloed thinking of academia is one of the reasons why we've struggled with a lot of m movement within academia, but then that translates to other sectors as well on how we think about climate change. You're not thinking about, well, how's that gonna impact industry or what do they think about it or how you know, I'm an economist, but I don't, you know, maybe you don't understand the impacts or the engineering problems with this. And a lot of engineers think, well, we'll just solve this problem. And you go, but the economics of this don't work. You know, whatever it is, it's massively beneficial. It's tricky. Uh, thankfully, I don't run it. I know the people that do, and they do a great job. Um, and, uh, and they bring it together really well, which is so important. But the benefits far way outweigh any of those sort of difficulties. And I think, yeah, maybe we need, you know, more of those types of things, um, finding a topic and, and working on it, whether that's within finance, but bringing together lots of different parts of finance to make things more coherent and to make it easier for people to 
to communicate even between each other within an industry or within academia. Or something. Yeah. It's also to kind of struck in the 2022 report that it's that things are getting pretty political in this in this like they really are like getting to yeah yeah like the start the opening line um the health of the people of the world is at the mercy of a, a persistent fossil fuel addiction like those are pretty strong words for scientists and academics uh, it's probably quite different to what you find in imagine the ipcc report i'm not even ipcc is getting there it's beginning it to is, it is getting there but it, yeah. But, and, and certainly within the sort of, you know, the cop talks and stuff, you know, there's not a lot of talk about that. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's academia, shall we say, getting pissed off. That's probably what that is. Mm. At, well, you, you've not listened to us when we use more, you know, nuanced, right. polite language. And we've been saying this for a while, but maybe we need to say it in a way that is... Is that a particular trait of climate academics? That they're just getting annoyed? <laughs> I think so, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, I feel like I get more, I've been getting more annoyed because you're, you're like, well, we've been saying this, we've been trying, people don't listen, so, you know, sure, you can try other things, but also you can try being more clear about what you mean. Mm. Um, and I don't think, you know, the, the, there's the sort of famous thing about like academics doubling down and thinking that more facts will change things. I don't think that's true. Yeah. You know, I don't think people don't understand, so we need to give them more facts. But maybe the language we use needs to be less academic and more straightforward. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, that's a health journal. We're all doomed. <laughs> it's a health journal you know, talking about addiction and, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, like it, these it's, are terms that are well understood by the people who wrote it. And it also kind of goes on um, in the 21 report, it focuses on inequality. Yeah. You know, that's like, these are, these are like hefty political, uh, t like it, it is interesting like to, to see that there's a new appetite amongst academics to be, you know, to be stepping into the end of this world. And I think it's, I think it's, mm. it's becoming more, obvious I think to people that rising inequality is a barrier to being able to solve some of this and also it's not just enough to talk about well who's going to be impacted by climate change at a very aggregate level mm. who is going to be what's you know if it is the poorest people then you need to talk about equality in this it becomes part of the narrative because and, it, and as you say it becomes a bit more political because the decisions about how to make society more equal are essentially inherently political decisions. Yeah, yeah. and upsetting the people who are more equal than the others in general. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it, it's, it's not something I lead with mm -hmm. when I talk about it, you know, in my shows and stuff, but it's something I always talk about because it's- It's hugely important. It's yeah. massively important. Um, but once you've sort of built up people's trust a little bit more and then you start talking about it, people can be a bit more like, OK, I under, you know, I understand that this is an issue. And, and it is, I mean, it's so important. Um, I've yet to do shows to, you know, yacht parties in Monaco, but I'd be very happy to go and talk to these people about their lifestyles and <laughs> why they might yeah. want to accept higher tax rates. Yeah. If you're watching, if you're on a yacht, <laughs> sell your yacht. Yeah. Um, okay, kind of moving on to the to the kind of next, kind of more kind of firmly back into the, the, the academic bit. Um, you are a climate economist. Yes. And you have described that as many times as an oxymoron. Yes. <laughs> kind of like a cocktail sausage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the, the tensions between the two, the two parts, like uh, mm. the, the economics and the, the economics and the climate? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's something that's probably come to the fore even more in the last couple of years. Again, um, you know, what do we mean by, you know, whether it's green growth or whether it's you know, degrowth, or whether it's just you know a green economy, whatever, whatever you want to look at it, uh, where you want to look at it. And I've done some work on more recently on the circular economy, and which is a concept that's talked about a lot more. You don't necessarily have to be at odds. I don't think. 
not and growth potentially, but but having an economy and it being a sustainable economy. Sure. You know, growth of certain things is good. Growth growth of like small rubbery toys that my son likes that people have and then throw away. If you want to have a market economy, and maybe you don't, fine. But if you do want to have it, you need to make some decisions about what you want within that. And the consumption of yachts and other things, luxury, needs to pay its way. And so it fundamentally comes down to what do we value as a society and what do we want and do we if, do we want this type of economy, do we want to be able to consume? And I think most people, certainly at the moment, yeah, I'm not saying everybody, but it seems like our country at the moment is like, well, we, we like buying stuff. But the cost of people of buying lots of luxury things should be higher. So the things that we need, like energy, where prices are rising and being able to get to where we work and, you know, buying food, these sorts of things we need. They're necessities and they should be protected and they should be, everybody should be have access to these things. And the types of other luxuries that we have, again, I'm going to keep using yachts cause, and SUVs because they're the, the worst things in the world, but they consume fossil fuels, they impact things, you know, people massively. And the, the impact, the outweighed impact they have over their, the, the basic needs. Okay, you might drive your SUV to work, but you know, your yacht, you're not driving your yacht, you don't need a yacht, right? So what value does society place on someone having that? They're sort of changing the economy to make it more equal, I think, mm -hmm. is where I come from. I don't think that's necessarily inherently different to talk of green growth and degrowth. I think all these, I find the, the, the conversations around them a little bit, I think people are talking at cross purposes or they're saying the same thing from different perspectives. What we're talking about is fundamentally changing developed wealthier countries, economies to make them more stable to reducing their environmental impact, which is what everybody's, all of those people are still talking about doing. It's kind of the language around how you're talking about doing it. And you want to grow the things that we need as essentials and you want to reduce the things that are doing the unnecessary necessary harm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want, you can give me the job of going through national accounts and literally ticking Give me everything in the UK economy that we sell and I'll go through and say, is this, is this good for society or bad for society? Yeah, it's, a, it's a hard question to, to answer, but... It's pretty hard. Like, for example, we have, like, one thing economics, and like, I, like my underground is economics, one thing we're terrible at is counting trees. Like, it's counting, like, what is the value of the, of the natural world? We've done none of it. Like you know, the entire history of economics has been has been completely forgotten about that. But we need to find a way of pricing that in. How do you value that? That's just one of the one of the questions. And how are kind of climate economists um, kind of dealing with with issues with with properly counting for what's really important? Yeah. Since I've really become an economist, always been thinking about is well, you know, GDP as a measurement of certain stuff. How do you change how we measure things? But should you, you fundamentally need to change some basic economic theory about utility maximization. So the stuff that we do is based on, okay, I'm an economist, we're gonna maximize individual, we're gonna take a person, an example person, and they're gonna maximize their utility. And their utility is based on consumption. consumption. And so you fundamentally have a problem with Year one undergraduate economics being at entirely at odds with overconsumption and environmental problems. So, how do you fix that? You know, you need to overhaul 
how we're taught about these things from, you know, our teenage years, essentially, or, or our early 20s. And, and lots of economics still hasn't, you know, entire treasuries are run based on these principles. So as much as I'm an economist, I think economics is almost entirely wrong from its first assumptions. And that's frust frustrating. <laughs> this could be a difficult question, but what's the solution? <laughs> um, what we like is the numbers. So what do you, you want to look at? Well, what utility max I mean, how, what is utility? So you, do you have a... Hmm. a happiness quotient or... Yeah, how do, you, how do you begin to attach? Yeah, and I'm sure people have done it. I've, I mean, I've been reading about this for 20 years now and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's been done, but it's how do you take those types of things and make them the mainstream thinking. And it's hard to do in academia when people don't have the, uh, the time or the capacity to entirely, you know, there's expectations on what should be in courses and, you know, I think a lot of people think academia is incredibly radical and that they're being, you know, students are being taught. In my experience, it's exactly the opposite of that. It's the orthodoxy of what people are taught is Very strong. Yeah. is almost uh, always the case. Yeah, uh, one thing I heard you talking about um, on a different uh, podcast was the um, the advantage that the young have over the older generation in that uh, they can adapt and because they don't need to change because um, the you know the older generation have lived with certain expectations for an awful long time um, and and it's difficult to be to be giving things up uh, it sounds like you're making that that there's a parallel situation in academia where where it's kind of younger academics like yourself will be looking at it and going we just need to be making fundamental changes like grasp like start on the bottom pull out the roots roots and you know and, and start again yeah. um, but there's a lot of um, institutional resistance to that yeah, yeah. was that, that, that a fair comment I'd, I'd completely agree i think you've summed up that far better than i could have um so that's the end of this conversation thank you um, <laughs> no but yeah you're, you're absolutely right because yeah change is hard and it takes time. So even because there's the resistance to change, because of the institutional inertia of incumbents, and it's the same with academia, it's, it takes time. So yeah, we might fundamentally overhaul things, but it might take another, you know, 30, 40, 50 years to be able to do that. And do we have the time to do that? And that, the problem we always come back to, I think, with trying to solve this is the time frame. The time frame now is nothing, mm. really. It's, it's the time that, you know, companies will invest, you know, I, 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 I want a, a solar panel or whatever last 25 years. That's I was taking us out to almost 2050 now. You know, the sort of investments that people are making are maybe over that sort of life cycle and that's so the investments made today are being made based on when we need to roughly be solving this. Yeah. The time frame's so short and nobody has any urgency around that. The decisions being made are that we've got still got loads of time and, and we're far from it. The thing that bother, probably bothers me the most around climate change as well is Oil and gas companies could have solved this pretty much about 20 years ago if they'd invested at that time, taken profits, invested it in carbon capture and built that up and said, we're just going to do this together as a, you know, a conglomerate, whatever it is, an, organ, you know, an industry. We'll all take... 5% of our profits or whatever it is will build up carbon capture, it'll be everywhere and we can exist for the next 100 years and no one will notice. And we won't get much kudos for it, but 
this alternative pathway that we're on now wouldn't happen. And no one within that industry clearly was brave enough to make that or to put forward these sorts of decisions. And what we're left with now is a scrambling of, you know, the night before the exam. How do we, there's no time left, how do, how do we solve this? And fundamentally, to do it in a way, to do it in the way that we would like to do it, which is slowly, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is, you know, given that example of oil and gas companies, that they could have achieved this in a way that, that would have done it in that sort of slower manner, where you don't notice it. Yeah. You don't have the upheaval, you don't have the massive transition. You essentially have carbon capture, you move electric car, you move to electric cars, and you sort of continue and sure, there's other problems, massive problems with the world, biodiversity loss, inequality, other things that we'd still need to solve. Mm -hmm. um, but the ire of that probably wouldn't be focused so much on these companies. Um, it would be more general and, you know, we'd have one less thing to, yeah. to have to solve. But are we making the same mistake again? And by we, I mean like the IPCC by making assumptions on large-scale adoption of carbon capture technologies in forward-looking looking forecasts. And by doing so, giving each country an individual a higher carbon budget than in reality we have. Well, sorry, in reality, that's a little harsh, but in, on the balance of probabilities, we're not going to get to the levels of carbon, carbon capture as doors they're talking about. Yeah, and, and to be fair, I mean, often with the IPCC, you know, I know lots of the people that work on that and stuff, they do put forward different options. It's that the options with the carbon capture are the ones that are often taken and parroted, shall okay. we say. So it's not that there aren't scenarios in there where you go, well, there's no, it's just that, and the IPCC doesn't do that. It's actually me and other people that run these models that decide whether to do runs with it. And, we'll, and we do tend to do runs with or without and then you put that forward and then it's people take the numbers with those runs and go, oh, well, if we have CCS, then the budget's this, so we're going to base it on that and whatever. So who's to blame? Well, lots of people, very much. Um, so a bit of a chicken and egg with that. You know, and you, and you will, again, with the nuance here, this is me coming back as an academic and being incredibly boring, but you will need it for things like cement. Mm. Right, because you have industrial process emissions that you need carbon capture True. for. Unless you're not building roads in Malawi, right? So, you, it's fundamentally required for certain things. And so there probably is a minimum amount that is needed. But, sh yeah, should we be running scenarios that only have those minimum, minimum amounts? Or should it be larger and you know and and the difficulty there is as academics a lot of academics are like well about as much steel production happens roughly using high hyd green hydrogen just now which is almost nothing right as is happens with carbon capture technologies well. <laughs> but the type of scale up of that is considered it's fine yeah. Right, because it's a it's a positive thing that certain people are happy as a technology to talk about, and there are probably issues with where do you get the hydrogen from? Is it a bit, you know is there going to be a global hydrogen market or for or national hydrogen markets enough to be able to scale these things up? It's hard as academics you you can't be making decisions about one technology in a positive light and other technologies in a negative light just because you that's how you feel. Mm -hmm. And that's where the problem with CCS often comes from. Now, do I personally think it is going to be scaled up to levels? Well, probably not, depending on who, what the decisions are that's made and who's investing in this. Yeah, probably not. But how, how do you make these decisions as an academic as to what things that don't exist now in the future do exist or don't exist? And you try to, what you try to do is run different scenarios with 
different assumptions about those and who picks up those scenarios and uses them is out with your control to some extent. Mm -hmm. And uh, last question is then, um, okay, well, first off, how can we find that? How can we find that? Well, you, warming up comedy, yeah. climate cool. change. Yeah. And, and, and how do people find you? Is that Me, so mattwinning.com yep. uh, or on Twitter, Matt Winning, Instagram, all these things. Yeah, but go to my website, there's lots of links to stuff. Um, and please do, yeah, buy the book. And if you've got questions, email me and I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. All right, here's actually the last question. Um, we, climate is a really hard thing. Just for, for the listeners, it's a really hard thing to broach. So like, you know, you sit around, you're talking to somebody, you bring up climate, the natural instinct is kind of, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. How do we get better at that? And just having, like, just no, normal, normal, not a comedian, not a scientist, whatever else, just how do you broach that and make it, you know, without the, a uh, little bit lighter, a little bit more, more kind of approachable, to have, the, to get those conversations going? Yeah, that is, it, it is hard, but I think what you need to do is you need to think about what are the other, what, who, who are you talking to, to who you're having the conversation with, what are, they, what are they interested in? And what is it that you've found out or the knowledge that you would like to maybe begin to talk to them about it and find a way? And, and often that is hard, but if you find a funnier news story or if you find something that you share, you know, that you like, whether it's, I don't know, snow sports or something and you want to, like, that is a way into talking about it. So just be like, you know, I don't know what this is going to be like, you know, what are our holidays going to be like together in 25 years or something like that. And, you know, I, my instinct would then to be, you know, to think about like, well, we're going to have to find something else, you know, something else to do and what's that going to be, you know, it's, it's starting to have like hearted conversations, but you're clearly talking about the subject. And so I don't think you can necessarily get rid of that, like, it's just, there's, a, it, there's choices that you're constantly making when you're having conversations about whether you're making things more or less depressing. <laughs> and it's actively trying to keep the positive, positive parts of your brain engaged and trying to constantly engage other people in their positive parts of the brain. Can ha you can have to take a little bit of a step back or try and, you know, if you're too emotional. I found it really hard to do it initially because I was so emotionally invested in it. And it actually took me going and speaking to other comedians and showing them the stuff that I had and the jokes that I had at the time and beginning to start seeing it from their perspective. And they would come out with other stuff really easily because they weren't emotionally involved in it. So they'd be like, oh yeah, what about this? And I'd be like, yeah, that's a really great point. They're like, oh yeah, I never thought of that, I mean, whatever. And so it was those conversations with people that maybe weren't so emotionally invested in it, that were coming at it from a, basically if I'm saying, go and talk to some comedians, <laughs> I guess. I don't really know how else you do it. Um, it. It is about keeping that viewpoint of maybe I'm not saying don't be engaged in it, because you, you know, we are engaged in it. But it's okay to take yourself out of it. It's okay to try and see it how other people see it for a bit. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's healthy to do that. Right. Okay, but thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Real pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us on that conversation. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope that you uh, learned something. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and uh, to subscribe to, uh, to any of our channels. And uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. This series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club.